Well, that was some fun. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to all of you. We're so grateful that you've brought the church into these rooms in which we've gathered. But right now, I'm going to invite you to be seated because you've earned a, a, a break, a rest. Hey, we have had an amazing day. This is service number six for us. Yeah. And... And we've been waiting for you guys, I just tell you. But let me just tell you some of the, we've had some amazing connections today, haven't we? Just uh, people from, we had a, a group of men and women in a mess hall in Afghanistan uh, in, with us earlier today. We had some guys in Iraq who were with us online, worshiping with us. Part of them, their families were here, they're in Iraq. It was a great connection for us to make. We've had men and women from correctional facilities with us at, at, service, at almost all the services and many other folks. But let me just mention a few folks who are with us right now online. Uh, Brad and Diane, Valerie and Garrett, a military family in Savannah. Welcome to you guys, so glad. They used to be here all the time. They're now in Savannah, but glad you all are together for Christmas. Uh, Grace is online from Mesa, Arizona. Ashley is from uh, Palmerstown, New Zealand. Clearly, you traveled the farthest to get here today. Uh, James is in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Anne's in Lebanon, Iowa. Many, many others online. Also, I know that my Nana and my family are online in Gainesville, so hi, Oh, Nana. man. <laughs> Look at this girl. You got to be really proud of this girl. Um, this is pretty awesome. That's awesome. Do you want to tell them anything? Love you. Okay. I was hoping she'd say that to you. <laughs> Hey, so Kaylee, uh, one last thing. I know we're taking a look, because this is our last service of the day, I do want to take a moment and just thank all of the folks that have worked so hard to pull this together. Yeah. I mean, our worship team and Kaylee has led much of this effort and, and our worship team has worked so hard. Technical people that you never see that are <clears throat> up in that booth back there and uh, working online and at that booth back there and at a booth back there. Uh, technicians who have just done extraordinary work all this week. You can please do that for them. And all of the ushers, I went to the last row of ushers before this service, and we got people that, all the way at the back of the room, out in the parking lot, the people that are working that parking lot. Those are volunteers who just come to take care of you and serve you today. We're so grateful to them. And we're so grateful for you guys, too. We're thankful that you brought the church into this room. Yeah, we are just, like Vernon said, we're just so excited to be with you guys. And we know, like, every week when we gather, we do so for a purpose. And that purpose is always to worship God for who he is and what he has done. That's right. And all those jobs are exactly that. They're a part of that purpose. And not only are we doing this this weekend, uh, but next weekend, we want to just remind you that we've got a really extraordinary service planned for you next weekend. If you're new, we'd love for you to come back. We are going to be singing some more. We'll, we'll do worship, but we also have uh, some folks from Living Letters who are going to be here uh, next weekend. Juliet Trafton is a Broadway-based, New York City-based uh, actress who is part of this. She's going to present the story of Ruth, and it's extraordinary. It'll be a great way for you to end up your year. Promise you, you'll never see this story in the Bible again the same way again after seeing it next weekend. Please come back, bring your friends. We'd love to have you. But you can read all about that in the worship guide that you were handed. What you can't read about is the person next to you. That was good smooth. transition. That, that was super that's, smooth. Uh, yeah, that's it's really smooth. <laughs> She's been giving me a little grief about that. But um, so right now, we'd love for you just to take a moment and just stand up and meet and greet. If you didn't get enough jumping, then jump and high five. Kaylee and I will show you how. Yeah. Great, great, great job doing that. You're friendly people. You can be seated again if you would. 
So if you haven't been with us during Advent, let me catch you up real quick on what we've been studying together. It's, it's a series that is called Light Has a Name. And we base that out of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where we're told that God is with us, Emmanuel. But in that verse, it describes God as a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. And tonight at this service, Pastor Matt will be teaching us about the Prince of Peace part of that verse. And so we're so glad you're here. I've loved this series. Yes, it's been so good. And also every week during Advent, we have been telling the story of Christ coming to earth, of, of this light uh, bursting through the darkness. And it's such, a, it's such a big story that we've been telling it piece by piece every week. We've heard uh, parts of the story from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we've been able to hear from lots of different members of our Northland family. Uh, and so tonight, we're gonna hear from Casey Brennan, who is one of our worship team members, as she tells us the final piece of this story. Advent is the season when we gather to celebrate the coming of the light of Christ into the world. It is a season of expectation, preparation, and fulfillment. We will be reading the words of Isaiah the prophet as he foretold the coming of the light of the world in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Our gospel reading will be from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. 
This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. gone into heaven, the shepherds said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby who was lying in the manger. this season by lighting candles to represent the light of Christ. Tonight, we light two candles. One symbolizes the love that Christ brought. The other, the Christ candle, signifies the coming of the light into the darkness. was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ. Let's pray together. <laughs> so Lord Jesus, here we are, not just in a church service, not just in a Christmas Eve celebration. We're standing in the midst of our journeys, our stories, our triumphs, our aches, our tears, our laughter, our questions, our dreams, our brokenness, our darkness. And we're all over the map in terms of where we are with that last chorus that we just sang. Every one of us has been equally created to live our lives in adoration of who you are. But we're different places in our embrace of that. Some of us long ago trusted Jesus as king. Others of us are 
not even remotely interested, but we're here because somebody invited us, a relative. Others of us are seriously kicking the tires and we've run into a number of dead ends in our journey and we're thinking, well, maybe if I can get around this whole religious thing, maybe there is something to Jesus. And the list goes on and on. And there's no way for human words to address all the stuff that's ricocheting around in this auditorium and online as people are settling in for a time of stillness, really maybe for the first time in a number of days in this busy season. So here we are. You've assembled us together to not just punch a card saying we've been to a Christmas Eve service, but to speak into our stories for your glory. So I'll listen along with them. Would you speak? Light of the world, would you illuminate? Word of God, would you feed? I pray this in the name of the baby who grew up and died and rose again. Amen, amen. You can have a seat. Well, Merry Christmas. All right, now they're sneaking off. One more time, would you thank the worship team for what they have poured in to this weekend? Just seeing this process happen over these last months has been fantastic. And we're not done. Uh, they'll be back. But in the meantime, we're going to celebrate Christmas Eve as Northland Church, and I got to start by saying we're so glad you're here in this auditorium and also online, and I need to say something else. You guys clean up really good. I mean, you're looking good. I, I, um, somebody asked me, did I wear a tie as a Christmas present to you guys? That's a, Oh, you like it? Yeah. I didn't. That's not my, I, I took a shower, but I, that, my tie is not a Christmas present, but I did bring a Christmas present present. So here you go. Um, when you have a Christmas present on Christmas weekend, this close to Christmas Day, don't you think it's appropriate to open it? That was so weak. Come on. Do you think it's appropriate to open it? Okay. All right. So while I'm opening it, I'll give you a little bit of the background. Um, this is a present I gave to myself several years ago. You guys ever buy a Christmas present for yourself? It's helpful. It keeps me motivated when I do that. And here we go. It's a flashlight. I need some reactions. Okay, that's that was better. Not just any flashlight, this is one bright flashlight. Ah, it's not only a bright flashlight, it's a waterproof flashlight. It's a dive light. Okay, you guys are mocking me now. You're just kind of going along with it. Some of you might want to ask, why did you give yourself a dive light for a Christmas present? Thank you so much for asking. So let me tell you, um, a buddy of mine and I went down to Cozumel several years ago. His name's Rick. We're both divers. And we went down to get our advanced scuba certification. And one evening we did an optional night dive. Now people will ask me, even this week, well, what's a night dive? All right, so it's not that difficult. Let's go ahead and cover a couple of the basics. Let's take two of those words and, and evaluate them. Number one, it's a dive. Number two, it's at night. Now you're following. Once you get those two factors in, you know you need a dive light. I'd never been on a night dive, so I needed a dive light. I went into the dive shop there on the island, said, I want to buy a dive light. He said, you don't need to buy one. We'll rent you one. I said, great. I said, are these batteries fresh? He said, "See, sí, senor. I said, all right. I headed off to the dock at dusk, met Rick there and two other pairs of divers, because you always dive with a buddy. So three pairs of divers and a dive master. We get on the dive boat and head out to the dive site. Now in Cozumel, it's different than other dive sites in that you don't go to one spot and the boat anchors, you go dive around and then come back up. The currents are way too strong along the Yucatan Peninsula there. They are moving at quite a click. So the dive boat drops you off along the coral reef, you drift along, and then you emerge, say, 45 minutes later, an hour later, and the boat picks you up. 
And the, di the night dive, you're doing all of that, it's just at night, in the dark. So it's a moonless night, but we were excited. We're trucking out, I guess you're not trucking out, we were boating out to the site, and the guy, the dive master said, okay, seniors, masks, fins on, because you got to get out at just the right moment to hit the reef where they want you to hit it. So we got all set, went over to the side of the boat, turned our lights on, and jumped into the water. And we started going down, down, down. Some of you right now can't even concentrate because you're thinking, would you explain one more time why you do this at night? I mean, it's hard enough for some people to imagine going under the water where breathing is not free during the daytime, but why would you do it at night? Well, the reason is the coral reef during the day is a thoroughfare. It's like an interstate of marine life and animals and fish. It's fascinating. But at night, it's rush hour. Everybody comes out to play. And you see stuff you would never see during the day, and this dive was no exception. We leveled off at about 53 feet, and it was phenomenal. In fact, it was the best dive of my life for 22 minutes. <laughs> and at 22 minutes, with my depth gauge reading 53 feet, my light flickered just a little, and it was incredible how quickly it happened. The battery gave out and the light went out. And the current did not stop moving. I didn't know if I was about to hit the coral reef. I got disoriented. I didn't know which way was up. I was starting to have to pay attention to the bubbles and, and that helped me orient which way was up. My breathing started accelerating. I felt confusion. Weakness, even though adrenaline was pumping, I was powerless. Aloneness settled in. A longing for things to be different was about all I could think about at that moment. And then I saw something that settled me. It was my friend Rick, my dive buddy, his light. And I saw it, and all of a sudden, I settled back down. There was something about at least seeing his light. Now, he didn't see me. I disappeared, he told me later. I'm going along, he said, and then you were there, and then just a second later, you were gone. I don't know if you've ever noticed that dive uh, wetsuits are, are black. Typically, I never knew the reason for that. The reason for that is when your dive light goes out, the black camouflages you from your dive buddy so he can't find you. It's really convenient. <laughs> so he doesn't know where I am. And remember, it's a drift dive, so I've got to, to swim over to him, and I grabbed him on the leg. <laughs> it's all right, it was already a wetsuit, so... Uh, <laughs> this person who had totally disappeared now was once again visible to him. His eyes were as big as saucers, and I, got, I went through some sign language, said, okay, you know, my dive light's out, I'm going to go over to the dive master and uh, get an additional one, because the guy in the dive shop had said, hey, if it goes out, the dive master will have an extra light. I went over to the dive master, grabbed him on the leg, same thing happened, scared him to death. But I, there are a lot of dive signals, and one I've never seen before, and I learned that day, it's, it's a dive signal that means... I have no dive light, you're on your own. And this is what it looks like. It's, so he said that, and so I went back over to Rick, said, I don't have a dive light. You and I are gonna be BFFs. I mean, we're best friends forever. We're gonna closer than we've ever been. And so I'm drifting along with him, two to three feet, four feet, but right there, and I'm totally dependent on his beam of light. There's no peripheral vision because of how dark it was, and it wasn't going that great, but I, we were enduring it. And I was just below him to his right. The beam of his light was off over my right shoulder. And we are panning over to the right. And then his beam stopped on the snout of a shark that was about seven feet away and about nine feet long, staring right at me, right on my level. <laughs> I think I inhaled half my tank of air right there. <gasps> But it was good because that gave me buoyancy to go up above the shark at that point. So now I'm above the shark. All the other divers gather around because Rick did this number that, hey, there's something interesting here and it's not Matt. Um, they pay attention to the shark a little bit. Now, it turns out that it was, it was a nurse shark. 
they're relatively harmless. They don't bother humans a whole lot. But let me tell you something. When you're 53 and under, you don't have a dive light. Adjectives don't matter when it comes to a shark. A shark's a shark. The shark swam away finally, and now I'm left with six dive lights down there. One of them's attached to my, my friend Rick, but I don't know which one. So I go down in process of elimination. I'm going to each one, playing the are you my mother game, you know that story? Hey, are you my dive buddy? No, and scaring each person equally the same, grabbing them out of the dark. About three or four in, I finally found Rick again. He's got big saucer eyes, and he and I voted unanimously immediately, this is nuts, we're surfacing. This is just too stressful. So we went up, signaled to the dive boat, uh, and uh, waited for everybody else to join us, and then got our money back. And a couple of months later, at Christmas time, I gave myself a present. <laughs> and I like my present. And it actually is a good gift for Christmas, because it's Christmas where we celebrate the Advent of God who became flesh. In Scripture, two Advents are talked about, prophesied. The first Advent is both prophesied and recorded. It's the Advent, the coming of Christ that we're celebrating now. The second Advent will be when He returns to complete the process that He began. And we're in this mysterious in-between time in which the redemption has already begun but is not yet completed. And in the midst of that, we're navigating a world that is still fallen, that is still dark. And if I'm going to get Christmas, I've got to get Christ's birth. If I'm going to get Christ's birth, I've got to get light. And if I'm going to get light, I've got to get my own darkness. A lot of times people think at Christmas time, what we're supposed to do is ignore the darkness, distract ourselves from the darkness, pretend it's not there. Biblically, we're called to be honest and authentic and embrace our darkness, not turn our back on it, because it's my darkness that actually enables me to celebrate more, not less, because the gospel is real. But in the prophecies in the Old Testament, in the historical accounts in the New Testament, this whole notion of light and dark continually comes up. Take, for example, the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 8, starting with, <clears throat> at the end with verse 20, 22. Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. I'd never read that passage like I read it now before that dive light incident. That whole notion, can't see your hand in front of face, I'd never really experienced that. I experienced it then. And I actually mentioned four words. You might not have noticed them, but they were very intentional. Darkness has an impact on us. It's on a number of levels, but four of those levels are this, confusion, weakness, aloneness, and longing for things to be different. The darkness is the fallenness. I don't think it's news to any of us that we live in a planet that's broken. And in the midst of that darkness, and I don't know what yours is right now, maybe it's a relational something, maybe it's family, maybe it's a health issue, maybe, maybe it's finances, maybe it's job, maybe it's something at school. But I want to encourage you, instead of trying to suppress it, like keeping a beach ball underwater, go ahead and let it come to the surface, embrace it, engage with it, while at the same time embracing the light. The prophet continues. He says, this darkness, this utter darkness is there, it's real. But then there's this amazing word, it's a gospel word. It's not a word you typically say is a gospel word, but the next word is nevertheless. So I don't know what your darkness is, but nevertheless, in the face of that darkness, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor the Gal Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So this prophecy that comes hundreds of years before Christ's birth says, in the midst of the darkness, a light's going to arise. The people, verse two, the people walking in darkness, the people scuba diving in darkness, the people doing life in darkness, doing relationships in darkness, 
darkness, doing jobs in darkness, doing parties in darkness, doing addictions in darkness, doing hobbies in darkness. The people that are grappling with reality in the midst of darkness, those people, which is everyone, for those who will look, those people can see a great light. And on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light is dawned. And here's the deal. That light has a name. That light is a person. Verse six, for to us a child is born. It's fully human. To us a son is given, fully God. And the government, the leadership, the sustenance of the universe will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace or Prince of Shalom. Now we've been in this series this month of December of Advent, looking at each of those terms, those names. But I've saved this for this weekend. Those actually are not four different names. In the Hebrew, which is the language that Isaiah wrote in, it's singular, not plural. It's one name. All of those are one name. In the Hebrew, it's Peleo Ez El Gabor Abaya Ad Sar Shalom. His name, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom. And the light beckons us into relationship, summons us in the midst of our darkness. I don't know what yours is. I know some of what I'm dealing with. And I, there's, there's always darkness, plenty of darkness to go around. It's an invitation, though, to go deeper with the gospel because it's an invitation to go deeper in terms of grappling with who Jesus is, this name that is above every name. Biblically, Name is not just, a person's name is not just their, ident their, their, uh, I their label, their identity. It, it is their competency, their capacity. It's who they are, what they do. His name shall be called. But it is appropriate to look at the, those, those, that one name in four different aspects because of all the different things that are emphasized. So what I want you to do, go back. Embrace whatever that darkness is and those, those four realities that always happen, confusion and weakness and aloneness and longing, and let's compare them with those four names. First, in the midst of my darkness, wonderful counselor comes to me in the midst of my confusion and brings guidance. The wonderful counselor brings guidance to our confusion. I don't care how smart we are figuring out this this, this life journey thing and this humanity thing, it's not, it's not something we can figure out on our own because we didn't create ourselves. And every now and then we get disoriented. In fact, we're born disoriented in a lot of ways. Did any of you guys read Dante's Inferno when you're in high school or did you just read the cliff notes? That's what I did and I just got the cliff notes. And, but Dante Alighieri wrote his Inferno his divine comedy. And because I read the cliff notes, I missed the first line of the book until years later. You know what the first line is? He's put himself in this story that he's writing, puts himself in that story as a 40-year-old man. And this is how he opens his book. In the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood and the true way was wholly lost. It was dark. Robert Frost, the poet, says, I am one who is acquainted with the night. We are all acquainted with the night, but in the midst of that confusion, this is what the light of the world says. Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus says, hey, follow me. It's not to turn me into a religious nutcase. It's to turn me back into a fully fulfilled human being restored into the original purpose for which I was created. That's what following Christ looks like. 
But to actually celebrate Christmas authentically, substantively, is not just to relate with him as a wonderful counselor in the midst of my confusion, but to relate with him also, secondly, as mighty God in the midst of my weakness. And as mighty God, he brings strength to me in the midst of my weakness. And I don't care how strong you think you are. We encounter stuff that we, we feel powerless over. How about it? What sharks are you dealing with right now? What sharks am I dealing with right now? A medical condition that's debilitating? A marriage that's unraveling? A parent that's declining? A child that's rebelling? A pregnancy that's not happening? A friend that's betraying? A bully that's abusing? A job that's disappointing? a boss that's undermining, a bank account that's diminishing, a disappointment that's haunting, a depression that's suffocating, an unfulfilled dream that's taunting, a fear that's paralyzing. Maybe it's a sin that's shaming or just a life that's unfulfilling. Whatever the shark is, along comes the light of the world. And Jesus says this in John 16, I tell you these things so that in me you may have shalom, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. In this world you will have darkness. John 16, But take heart. I've overcome the world. Take heart. Yes, the struggle is real, but so is the gospel. The darkness is real, but so is the light. And he's mighty God. And he doesn't shrink back from any shark. The third aspect of his name brings the intimacy. It's not just that he's wonderful counselor and he, he knows the right way to go. And mighty God, that he's, he's strong and able to take me there. Thirdly, he's everlasting father and he brings love to me in the midst of my aloneness he cares John 3 16 for God so loved I got news for you whatever darkness you're grappling with God's not lost your number he loves you are there mysteries? Absolutely. The unanswered questions, you bet does Christianity come along and throw out a five dollar answer to those million dollar questions? No Religious simpletons might, but not Jesus. At Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept, even though he was about to resurrect him. Why? Because he loved him. And he was encountering in full force the impact of the fall, the impact of human beings living in the consequences of their rebellion and living in darkness. And he enters into that. I don't understand the mystery of it. Why the delay between the first advent and the second advent is what it is, but God has his purposes that will bring him the greatest glory that we do now. And in the meantime, he loves us in the darkness. I'm not alone. John chapter 1, verse 4. This, this life, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. That life is referred to in John 1, 4. In him was life. See, the eternal life promise in John 3, 16 is not just a future quantitative thing. It's a present qualitative thing. It's what I refer, I refer to as life with a capital L. God doesn't determine whether I'm alive or not just by whether my heart is beating and my lungs are breathing, but whether I've been restored into the original trajectory for which I was created. And in Jesus was life. Life, that life with a capital L was the light of all mankind. That 
His light leads me on a path of life, leads me back to where I belong, which brings up the fourth aspect that completes this picture that Isaiah is painting for men and women who are not just going along punching Christmas Eve cards, but are grappling authentically with their journeys. And he says, he's wonderful counselor for our confusion. He's mighty God for our weakness in the darkness. He's everlasting father for our loneliness in the darkness, but he is also prince of shalom for our longing in the darkness to bring restoration. We all have longing. We've done it this week. I have a couple of phone calls. You respond. Maybe you don't articulate it, but I think it, some version of this is not right. This is not how it should be. A parent shouldn't get that news from a child. An employee shouldn't get that news from a fellow employee. We shouldn't be reading this kind of headline. Where do we get that notion that the world is not as it ought to be? It's embedded in us as his images. And it expresses itself in our longings for things to change for things to get brighter. And I don't typically read a quote of this length, but you're tracking, and so I am going to. James K.A. Smith. It's about Christmas Eve. Maybe you consider yourself secular, an atheist perhaps, or at least agnostic, and generally just completely unconcerned with God or religion or church or any of that. It's not like you've left the faith or killed God. He just never existed in the Brooklyn you call home. Indeed, in the circles you run in, matters of spirituality or transcendence just never arise. Uh, the existential world is flat. You're over it. Let's move on. Sure, we're all trying to find significance or make meaning and vaguely trying to figure out just what the heck this is all about. But come on, that doesn't mean we're going to entertain fairy tales about saviors being born in a manger. Which is why you're constantly puzzled by all these people you read about in the New York Times or the New Yorker who are like super religious, people who can't imagine that God does not exist. They seem to inhabit some other universe than your own. But then one of your friends starts flirting with Catholicism. After a few months, she invites you to St. Patrick's Cathedral on Christmas Eve. Hmm. And you're thinking this must be just a therapeutic strategy, a kind of puritanical form of self-medication, but you just can't bring yourself to go along. So you stay home alone, and before you know it, just as the bourbon has taken hold, one of those unbelievably ambiguous and nostalgic songs by the musical group, The Postal Service, comes on. You know, one of those songs with a sprite light tune that lulls you into thinking it's just banal triviality and then, then all of a sudden the lyrics hit you. Lyrics like I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, pretending the echoes belong to someone, someone I used to know, and you're spooked by the longings welling up, naming something that wells up in you from some subterranean cavern in your consciousness and you feel stupid that you're crying but you can't stop and you want to just blame it on the bourbon and the loneliness and yet there is the oddest taste of some distant joy calling to you in those tears. And you're not sure what to do with any of this. Pay attention to those. Those longings are like breadcrumb trails that can lead us home. The Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Peace. In the Old Testament, peace, shalom is mentioned about 238 times. Only 36 of those times is it referring to the absence of war or conflict. The rest of the time, it's referring to a restoration of wholeness, of completeness of the way things ought to be. When a human being wishes another human being shalom, they're wishing them back into the original trajectory for which they're created. We're not home yet, we're still in the darkness, but the light enables us to get a head start on shalom. But the Prince of Shalom comes, it doesn't just kind of dole it out in a nice sentimental way. 
violence was involved that he subjected himself to. Some of you here at Northland know that I told you this a couple of weeks ago, every Advent season, every December, I carry around in my pocket all the time a nail, just a little small carpenter's nail. And it's to remind me in the midst of all of the trinkets and toys and festivities that this baby is not just a little symbol. He grew up. He was born explicitly to die to subject himself to death on a cross. It was not the death of, of being a martyr. It was a sacrificial substitutionary death in which he took on himself the penalty of the rebellion of the entire cosmos, including us. Dying in our place, fulfilling a payment that otherwise it would take me all eternity to pay. And he says, if anyone would come after me, if he would acknowledge what I've done for him and let what I did on the cross be credited to his or her account, they're coming into the light. And this baby was no mascot. He was king. John chapter 1, 4 that I read a moment ago, I'm going to read it again, but I want you to see verse 5 as well. John 1, 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. But look at that light. That light was not just some mood lighting off to the side. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not cattle and bottle overcome it. Whatever darkness you've got, the best news I've got is not put on a Christmas carol, pour yourself something to drink and get your favorite dessert and hope it goes away. My assurance for you is that in the midst of your darkness, the light has come and is beckoning you now. And that light has a name. And he is the son of God, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, in the line witch in the wardrobe, the kids go to this land of Narnia where Aslan is the, the, the allegorical Christ figure. Mr. Beaver describes Aslan to Susan, one of the little kids, and is describing the majesty and the power of Aslan. And Susan says, but well, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver said, of course not. But he's good. And he beckons us. But I'll tell you what's not safe, darkness. The Son of God has come. And to enable you and me to experience a Merry Christmas in the true sense of the word, it's not just doing something sentimental, but engaging with the substance, the substance that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And that light makes your darkness tremble. Let's stand together right now and celebrate that. Jesus, Jesus, 
You may be seated. And so light has a name. You've heard many of those names that we use for that light. Jesus, Emmanuel, Adonai, Elohim, Yeshua. You've heard us being taught very clearly tonight that that light came for your darkness to conquer it. And it's a mystery that through the immensity of the Godhead, that that would take the form of intimacy in a baby born in a manger. And for us, what a mystery that is. And yet, Paul would tell us that it's the light that we've been looking for, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we know also that wherever that light shows up, it's a holy place. And so we want to use one more expression of that light tonight as a reminder of the holiness that God has brought into our lives to dispel the darkness. At the end of each row, there are some baskets of candles. If you would take one of those and pass that basket on down the row and go ahead and light that candle. And as you do, be reminded again that wherever Jesus is, it is a holy place that includes this room we're in, the room you're in out there. Wherever you are in your journey, as Pastor Matt said, join into the holiness of this moment. Sing with me. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Thrill of 
looks beautiful in here. And we're going to do one more thing with these candles, but I have just an announcement to tell you that I don't know how to work in except just to tell you this. We've got poinsettias all over this property, and we want you to take them home with you tonight. I'm not kidding. Uh, they're live poinsettias, and they will be alive as long as you take care of them this week. There's a significance to them, though, because they were donated by people who donated them in honor of a loved one. And so the right thing to do would be for you to take that home and care for it. And every time you look at it, you don't know who donated what. But just pray for people that are missing someone this time of year. And so as you leave tonight, you'll uh, see them all over the property. I'm not talking about the silk plants or anything like that out there, okay? <laughs> Just the live poinsettias, okay? We have security. Um, <laughs> hey, but there's one more thing that we want to do with these candles, and it's this. If you would raise your candle as high as you can, and now look around the room at this light. These are your dive buddies. So freeze this picture in your mind, in your heart. And use it on one of those nights like Pastor Matt described to us. Thaw it out and use it then. And so now as you bring the light back down, don't extinguish it yet because Kaylee wants to tell you something about that. <laughs> That's right. Well, we've been talking about how Jesus is the light of the world, how he came into the darkness to illuminate our lives. And, and this is a good, these candles are a good reminder of that. But it doesn't end there. There is this whole other piece to the gospel. Uh, Pastor Matt uh, yesterday was telling me the follow-up to his dive light story. And he said that the next time he went diving, he brought his three sons with him. And he also brought his very own dive light. And he made sure that there were fresh batteries in it and everything. And he also gave each one of his sons a dive light as well. And then he gave them a, a backup for the dive light and then a, a backup for the backup. I think I got that right. Yeah. Uh, yes, you did. And to each of their oxygen tanks and their air tanks on the back, I attached different color strobe lights <laughs> so I could keep an eye on them. Yeah, just in case. Oh, that's great. He had experienced what it was like to be in utter darkness. And he saw how, how necessary, how, how comforting it was to have light in the midst of that darkness. And so he wanted those that he loved to have that light as well. And you know, church, that's what you and I are called to as well, that, that when we experience what it's like to have light in the midst of darkness, when we experience the love and power of Jesus' presence in our lives, where we can't, we can't keep, that, keep that to ourselves. It's something we've got to share with other people. You know, Jesus said that he was the light of the world. But he also said that you and I, church, we are all the light of the world as well. Absolutely, Kaylee. And one of the most amazing benefits about having that light illuminate our lives is to be able to take that light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ yeah. into a dark world and shine that light in this dark world for Jesus Christ. So good. And that's such an exciting thing. And so we put a lot of thought into how we want to end our time together today. And we thought, what better way? than to go out of this place singing of this good news. So uh, you got one more in you? You got one more in you? OK, let's all sing this together. All right. Hey, everybody, before you leave, I got something to say. Yes. I'm bringing tidings of good news to tell you as you go your way. Hey. See, in the manger, he was baby king. Take those candles. We want you to put them back in those same baskets you got them from. Because you can't leave with those lights. We need those for next year. All right? 
once you put your candles in the basket, I want you to take those hands and clap them as loud as you can, because we're going to celebrate as we leave here today. Is that all right? All right, here we go. And everybody say go. Hope you appreciate our subtle hint. We love you. Merry Christmas, and you gotta go. God bless you. Good night. We love you.